We started 10 minutes late. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Do we have the African development? No, so we're going without it. Okay. I think here, just because it's like... Thank you, everyone. Each, Before we, we start really our next plenary, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. As you're all aware, our big keynote for tomorrow um, between Mayor Bloomberg and Dr. Kim will be tomorrow morning at 9. There's an opportunity to submit questions still. If you feed questions to the moderator, if you go to live.worldbank.org um, for the rest of the morning, that, that portal will still be open. So we welcome your questions and look forward to an exciting uh, session tomorrow morning. I want to note a change in the program that will be relevant after lunch. The session on governance after lunch, the room that's listed in the program is incorrect. The room should be MC2800. That's for the governance parallel session after lunch. So thank you all for joining us after your coffee break. Our second plenary this morning will talk about how to capitalize on the $175 billion commitment that was recently made to sustainable transport. Our panel will be moderated by Manish Bhapna from the World Resources Institute. Manish is WRI's Executive Vice President and Managing Director. He served as WRI's Acting President from 2011 to 2012, and previously in his career he was a Senior Economist at the World Bank. Manish? Great, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. Delighted uh, to have you here for what I think is going to be one a, a, a particularly stimulating session. Uh, as Eileen mentioned, the topic of this session is to discuss what is arguably one of the most important outcomes to come out of Rio Plus 20. The commitment by eight multilateral development banks to invest $175 billion over the next 10 years in sustainable transportation. And, and given the current trend lines we all know on urbanization, on car ownership, road accidents, air quality, climate change, we, we recognize just how absolutely crucial this shift to sustainable transportation is and how urgent it is that we tackle this in the next 10 years. Otherwise, it very well might be too late. And the big question, the question we're here today to discuss, is how can we make sure that this fairly significant commitment of $175 billion will play a meaningful role in catalyzing this shift? And we've assembled a first-rate panel of experts to help answer this question. We have Nestor Roya, the Transport Division Chief of the Inter-American Development Bank. We have Jorge Kogan, Senior Transport Advisor to the Vice President of Infrastructure of the CAF. We have Robert Guild, Director of the Transport, Energy, and Natural Resources Division of the Asian Development Bank. Jose Luis Idegoyen, Director of the Transport, Water, Information, and Communications Technologies Department of the World Bank. We have Corny Hausenge, the Joint Convener of the SLOCAT Partnership, Michael Replogle, Global Policy Director and Founder of ITDP, and Holger Dockman, the Director of Embark. And what, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask each of the banks, the representatives of the banks, to take three minutes uh, offer a brief overview of what their banks are doing against this commitment. I'll then invite the commentators for very short responses. I have a couple of questions I'm going to pose to the panel, and then we're going to open this up uh, to the audience. But before we start, I want to take a quick poll. I want to kind of capture the pulse, the mood of the audience. And, and I'd like to ask you all um, three options about whether or not you feel that this commitment is going to be a real catalyst, a real game changer in shifting transportation onto a more sustainable trajectory. Will it play a major role in getting the shift we ultimately need to see in the next 10 years? And so I want to, I want to kind of get a show of hands. First, how many of you feel this is going to be a game changer? It's a huge deal. More likely than not, it's going to succeed. Kind of a greater than 50% chance that this is going to be the game changer we're going to see. A show of hands. Okay. How many of you feel a bit quite uncertain? <laughs> Commitment could get this shift, but lots of things would need to fall into place, kind of 15% to 50% when we look back in 10 years, that this will be a big, big catalyst. 
And how many of you feel this is kind of business as usual, unlikely to make a difference, maybe on the margins, <laughs> but not really, not really going to do it? So it was quite interesting, you know, I mean, a, f a handful of optimists, quite a few realists, and, 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 and a few skeptics. So let's, let's see if we can move the skeptics and the realists to the other side. So let me, let me start with you, Nestor. Thank you. Thank you, Babna. I, I was told to go straight to the point, so I'm not going to, to thank the World Bank for being so fantastic <laughs> uh, host and uh, embark the organizer and, and Holger, and obviously all our, our partners, and I'm going to be straight to, the, to what IDB is doing. And I think IDB commitment is well underway. If, for the sake of comparison, if we look five years back uh, of the two b seven billion in, uh, of funding that we provided to the sector, 90% of that went to urban public transportation projects, which we can say are the more like uh, traditional type of sustainable uh, transport projects, which already also obviously need to be improved in the future, but that's uh, for the sake of comparison of what happened last year where our approved funding, uh, which included either objectives, components, or activities that have to do with sustainable transport, particularly urban transport, uh, well, were 26% of the total approval. Uh, uh, that's of 1.6 billion that was approved in the IDB last year. If we include the logistics, freight logistics project that have some type of uh, activity, that amount could go up to 16%, although it's important to recognize that a lot needs to be done still in, in, in logistics. But this is, this is uh, just like putting the, the rocket in the launching pad. Uh, this is just a small part of it, and uh, they, we need to make it uh, uh, take off. And that, and that requires execution, and execution requires institutions, require, requires political will, and requires even things that are more extra sector, like what we can say good financial wins, which looks like uh, are being in, in, in proof uh, at the moment. That's true not only for the MDBs, but it's also true for the countries, particularly we take into account that this uh, commitment amount that we have all made is, is big, is uh, significant, but it's still a very small part of the total investment that is done uh, by, the, by the countries, at least in, in the world, and obviously in, 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 in Latin America, uh, at, the, at the transport sector. That's why uh, REST, R-E-S-T, which is the acronym for the Regionally Environmental sustain uh, Environmentally Sustainable Transport Initiative in the bank, is key to make that rocket uh, take off, and that uh, that initiative has, uh, requires a lot of uh, good, new, innovative things of what we can say is the new world of sustainability, which uh, requires, which has a lot of things that are, as I said, innovative and new, so it requires uh, the creation of capabilities, knowledge creation, knowledge dissemination, um, awareness creation at all levels, uh, not only politically, but also in the private sector and on, and, on, and on civil society. And we need a spectacular, sustainable projects that will be uh, allowed to showcase uh, good practices and accomplishments. But besides these new and innovative uh, good things, we do also require a lot of the good things of the old traditional world, which are still scarce in the region. And I'm talking here about normal things like project management, capability <coughs> development, development, transport industry reform, in some cases regulation, in some cases uh, uh, deregulation in others, sound financial management of projects, and sound uh, implementation of, of, of new policies, good old traditional engineering, along with good new engineering and business practices. And, and that, and that uh, still needs to be done. And uh, what I want to, the message that I would like to say that, and that's what I'm not going to take the full minute that I have still, is we have to stop uh, talking, we have to continue acting. Uh, getting the rocket uh, off the ground is really the hard part. I think the amount, the commitment, is going to be re difficult hard, but it's not going to be the hardest part, and we saw it in the prior session where implementing, executing, and the role that MDBs have to
doing that is, is really is really the important part. I want to finish up uh, uh, restating and and um, re renewing uh, the commitment of the IDB to sustain the transport. Thank you. We'll just pass the mic and continue down the line. Hello, good morning to everyone. Thanks again to Embark and the World Bank for the invitation. Uh, we're pleased to be here again. Uh, CAF, the Latin American Bank of uh, the Development Latin American Bank is going through a process in where uh, we are not only shifting uh, some of the work we have been doing, but we are also bringing in new countries. So there is a growth that uh, involves change and involves more partners in the, in the, in the game. Uh, there are 18 countries now, member of CAF, and uh, we have been uh, shifting mainly from what we have been uh, financing in the past, we were rural roads into many more uh, urban transport projects. However, uh, we believe <clears throat> that sustainable transport is not only urban transport. I think we need to continue sustaining uh, transport in the regions uh, in where the uh, countries and cities are demanding for the help of the institution. And we believe that sustainable transport is like one that uh, can improve accessibility for all, not only, only within the cities, it can reduce congestion in the cities, but also uh, reduce the impact on the environment, uh, can stimulate the use of public transport and also the efficient use of, of, of energy, uh, improve safety, and particularly and more especially the capacity building and the <coughs> institutional reform. In order to do that, uh, since uh, five years ago, CAF have put in place the Observatory of Urban Mobility, uh, which have uh, originally included uh, 15 cities uh, last year, 12, 2012, and because of this commitment on pushing uh, harder for uh, sustainable transport, we have included 10 additional cities, so there are now 25 cities in the observatory, of which we have almost all related information uh, to its mobility, its development, its economy, and I think this is basic for uh, creating this uh, institutional and capacity building. Without the right information, it's very difficult to make decisions, it's very difficult to create programs and to develop projects. Uh, in addition to this, we have launched a new program, which is called Cities with Future, and this has meant two things. One is to align the internal offices of CAF, bringing together different areas that are now going to work together towards this objective of creating better cities, and we are launching this program for our clients in order to look not only at transport, but also at the other issues that are related to the growth and the development of a sustainable city. Uh, joining the e initiative of road safety with uh, other uh, multilateral development banks, we have taken charge of doing the first uh, pilot study on safety, and that is an area where we have, are working hard. And this is going to be related particularly to a phenomenon that we believe is crucial for the cities, and this is the growth of the ownership of motorbikes. Uh, motorcycles are becoming an issue not only in Latin America, but in the rest of the world, and we have uh, taken this issue as one that is going to be used by the community of the banks we have been sharing this initiative, uh, in particular with regard to the safety. <clears throat> aspects. Uh, we have included also uh, the uh, uh, road safety audits on all the projects that uh, CAF is financing. So we believe that uh, with the shift in, in emphasis into more urban than, than rural and these uh, changes that we are making in the process of helping the countries in, in building up uh, their institutional and capacities, uh, we will be contributing to this objective uh, in a better way. Okay, Robert. good. Good, thank you. Good morning to everybody. Um, in the ADB, we start from a recognition that the contribution of transport to sustainable development depends on three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental. So we define sustainable transport as transport that is accessible, affordable, efficient, financially sustainable, environmentally friendly, and safe. Just a short list of objectives there. <laughs> Uh, to operationalize this definition, ADB has adopted what we call our Sustainable Transport Initiative to scale up our operations in modes that are more sustainable, such as urban mass transit, railways, inland waterways, and non-motorized transport. We've set targets for our portfolio based on the avoid, shift, improve paradigm that have resulted in an increase 
from 2% to 21% for urban transport and a decrease from 78% to 57% for roads in just three years. This trend will continue to a point where urban and mass transport comprises more than half of our portfolio by 2020. Obviously, meeting more ambitious targets requires us to define, uh, design better projects. Our transport community of practice is formally involved at management and board consideration of proposals. We have a peer review system that is required to consider the principles of the Sustainable Transport Initiative, and we're now developing a new evaluation framework to guide concept and design, tentatively called the Sustainable Transport Appraisal Rating, or STAR. The STAR framework is intended to measure sustainability against economic, social, and environmental dimensions of our definition, as well as against the risk of actually achieving them. We have a set of guidelines and 18 sub-criteria that are both quantitative and qualitative. I won't go into the details of what all of those sub-criteria are, but uh, I will like to mention that the STAR framework is project-based, but it is designed so it can be aggregated to the overall portfolio. We're hoping to develop a system that is unified and transparent ratings that can be used to evaluate progress both over the life of a project as well as changes in portfolio composition. We're testing it now. We expect to develop it further through the working group of multilateral development banks that is being formed. So one of the things I'm looking forward to discussion here in the next two days is whether other organizations see potential in harmonizing some form of rating system so that we can ensure comparability and measure progress. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. We are the World Bank. Uh, the way we see sustainable transport is within the framework of inclusive green growth. What do we mean by that? Is the recognition that countries, developing countries, have to grow, and we have to support these efforts, but ha cannot be done at the expense of not being inclusive, creating differences, or accepting the social cost of this growth, and cannot be at the expense also of the planet. So that's why we are emphasizing certain aspects like uh, road safety, for example, from a social point of view, or access as a way of uh, differentiating say, the possibilities, the opportunities that different people have in terms of accessing jobs, even in an urban context or a rural context. Our transport strategy, 2008, is defined as safe, clean, and affordable transport for development. It's perfectly on the dot in this respect. And in seeing this climate change agenda, what we are, we are seeing that transport, because of the long life of the investments, you have the risk of locking in paths that may not be sustainable in the future and may also erode the competitiveness of an economy. So we are bringing this perspective into the climate change debate in, in balancing the importance of the sector when you look at not only the local benefits also, but this long-term impact as a result of the lock-in. As a result of this uh, strategy, many changes in the portfolio. First of all, compared to, to fiscal year 2003, the portfolio was 19 billion. Today we have a 40 billion portfolio. It's 23% of the World Bank lending. Looks big. It's uh, just a drop in the, packet, in the packet when you compare to, to the needs. Changes within the portfolio, more emphasis, for example, when we do roads on, on access and impact on the poor, on gender, for example, now 70% of our projects are gender informed, the social cost aggressively touch, tackling the issue of road safety, shifts within the portfolio more on railways, uh, the portfolio triple since 2003, big emphasis on urban, on urban transport for two reasons. First. This is where we have a win-win situation between the two sides of, uh, say, the lo local benefits and the long-term impacts uh, and, and the climate change agenda, also because of the rapid urbanization that uh, is the phenomenon of the century. So, for example, uh, the urban transport portfolio is like 50% in Latin America and is, is growing in, uh, in other regions, more than 20%, for example, in, uh, in last, last year. Uh, finally, um, what we see in, in terms of our role, three things that we have to work with you to do together. Yes, 
we have uh, projects and we have to help coordinate projects with complementary policies. This is not going to be achieved only by doing projects. We need the support of the, of the policies. Second, we have to help in coordinating policies in different domains. Today you cannot talk about transport policy without thinking energy policy. And also the different levels of government. You are not going to solve the problems at the city level if the government, the national government does not adopt a policy. And the third point, and I'm finishing with this, is we have to raise the profile of the transport agenda. The fact that, for example, the G20, in the, uh, the meeting led by, by Mexico, put urban transport on the agenda is unbelievable. It's an unbelievable achievement. The fact that we are working now together, for example, on sustainable development goals, it's a, an unprecedented situation. I think we have an opportunity here that we didn't have before. And just to underscore that last point, as someone who comes from the environment sustainable community, it is, it is quite remarkable how 10 years ago, transport was not on any agenda in a sustainability conversation. And yet at Rio, in the post-2015 framework, it, it is one of the most important topics that are being discussed. Let, let, let me turn to the commentators and uh, ask you, what, so, so you heard from, from these banks a little bit more about how they're going to implement the commitment. What, what, what excites you? What do you want to further discuss or challenge them on? And I take it, Corny, would you like to start? Yeah. Thank you. When we developed uh, this idea of the 175 billion before Rio, we, we were thinking about a game changer. And I think that we were successful in Rio. The question now is how do we keep the attention which was, which was uh, uh, gathered there? And I think two things are important. I think it's the transparency and the predictability. So I think like what is important is that the banks need to start reporting on the 175. And I think that uh, this should be done, I think also on a joint basis and not just because I think that up to now the banks have been speaking very much. We are doing this in our bank, but we have not heard a lot about what we are doing together. I think that Robert spoke briefly about uh, harmonizing uh, appraisal procedures. I think that the, uh, the second part is if we want to have this really as a game changer, we need to look at how do we leverage the 175 billion collectively versus new funding sources. And I think that that is partly the climate change money, this is partly private sector money, this is partly sovereign wealth funds and things like that. Because by having the commitment for 175 billion over the next 10 years, we can develop these kind of partnerships. I think that José Luis spoke about raising the profile of the transport sector. Again, I think it's important that we have a collective voice from the MDBs in the global policy discussions on climate change, on sustainable development. If we don't have this collective voice and if the banks continue to implement the, the projects just on, on an individual institutional <coughs> basis, I think that there is the danger that we would have business as usual. And I think that we need to keep thinking every year again for the next 10 years, how do we keep this as a game changer? Yes, I think uh, I agree with, in general with Corny's remarks on this being a game changer. Uh, I think we have a real opportunity to shift the conversation at a number of different levels with this commitment that was made at Rio Plus 20. It was unprecedented for these eight banks to talk with each other across a sectoral policy, it, in, it's my impression, um, and to make a joint public statement of the nature that was made at Rio Plus 20. I think that is a breakthrough. And I think the sustainable transport initiatives uh, that we've seen emerging in a number of the banks uh, starts to send important signals, but to make sure that there's real follow through on that, I think we do need to see some harmonization of indicators across the banks. Uh, may not be 100% the same, but, but there has to be some broad buy-in and there has to be a lot of transparency in the reporting process for the pledge to have uh, good credibility over time. I think there will certainly be great pressure uh, on the first anniversary of the pledge to say something about what progress has been made in the past year. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the coming months 
to lay a stronger foundation and begin building on it. Um, I think some of the work that, for example, the Asian Development Bank is doing with its star rating system could lay a good foundation for a dialogue with other banks about how some common indicators might be developed. For these uh, pledges and indicators, though, to really have uh, a strong effect, they need to be integrated into management reward structures in the banks. Uh, right now, there's still huge pressure for officers and executives within the bank to move more loan money. That's uh, Banks are in the business of lending, but here we need uh, to, to make sure that there's a move towards more sustainable development support while moving money. And I think that means opening up new gateways to sustainable transport financing and project preparation and developing new frameworks to, to bring in uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, pension fund money, venture capital in helping to develop sustainable transport projects, which right now are often of a smaller scale than the traditional projects that have moved through the bank's pipelines. And so the banks can play an important role as an assembler of that pipeline to put it into a form that can be financeable and that can have the confidence of the bank uh, institutions behind it to help leverage and bring in uh, that other uh, external financing. So, I, I agree with, with most, of, most of that was, has been already said. Um, I'd like to, to highlight two things um, from, from, from earlier which I think are key words also in terms of, of this agreement and also make this a success. I would say shift and targets. One is on shifting and there also to, to, to get back to Nestor. Nestor spoke about the innovative, sustainable, and the normal things we, we're doing. And the commitment was also we shifting existing money. We're not doing new things. We, we're shifting also our, our investment. So I think it's also now about the culture of, of doing the normal things in a sustainable manner. And you highlighted also the importance also of institutional setup, of capacity building. So to really think about not just the measurement, but also the principles, how we can also bring these good principles the banks already have also in normal projects towards all projects. And I think that's, that's also one, one of, 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 the, of the vital elements. And I think we need the measurement, but also we need also the principles here of, of good practice also to, to bring, bring that in. The second is, and here Robert came up also with the ADB commitment and the targets. I think the targets are important for two reasons. One is obviously measure internally and see do we achieve or in which direction we want to go. But I think the Sustainable Transport Initiative was particularly important because it was sending also a message to the rest of the world. We have understood, we have listened, we have learned also what happened on the ground and so therefore we have to, to also change. So therefore I think it's important also to, to have these targets and to have these targets from everybody and bringing that also to, together and, and report on that. But finally, the banks can't do it themselves. 175 billion in comparison to the overall transportation infrastructure, we're talking about one trillion of investment for one year. So therefore, this sends a message to the cities, to the countries. But in fact, also, it's a responsibility and we have to think about also what are the processes, how we can leverage those in the countries. And that's also the responsibility from, from the cities, from the national government to provide also the right processes and help also the, the, the national government and the cities also to, to, to access that. And I think so these are for me the three elements of shifting of targets, but also of process of, of, of integration and making use out of that money. 
Great. Thank you, Holger. I, I want to pick up on, on, on that last comment and bring it back to, the, to, to those of you at the bank and this issue of how to get to scale. Uh, a couple of you already spoke a little bit about this, but I, I think there's a couple of elements to it. One is this point about how do we make sure that what each of the banks do individually, collectively, is significant, this issue of harmonization that Michael raised, and what are the efforts that we're doing to help make sure that it isn't just an individual bank's commitment or contribution, but that collectively the sum is greater than the parts. But then I also want to turn to this leverage question, the point Holger made, which is you know, 15 to 20 billion a year is a lot, but relative to the trillion that goes in each year and the investments is very small. So this question about how you leverage. Jose Luis, you spoke a little bit about informing policy as part of that. Love to hear a little bit more from the banks about some of the, your thinking about how we're, gonna, how we're gonna get to this issue of scale and leverage. Would, please. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, uh, I think, uh, and, I, and I on purpose didn't, didn't say many of the other things that were mentioned in the in the in the in the room before uh, in regard of what are the technical principles or the um, economical or social principles avoid uh, avoid uh, shift improve uh, change of paradigm paradigm that we are trying to to put in place all together and I think we have a fairly a fairly joint vision in the planning part and that's what I and 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 now we are we are getting questions on how to measure. Uh, what we have planned in the doing, and that's okay, and we need to harmonize it. But we have to be careful, and, and particularly being MDBs, because we know ourselves, to put eight people in the room to build indicators. That's, that's really, 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 first of all, it's very hard to build it. Uh, second, uh, probably you are going to, is, is, you're going to probably uh, built on the on the on the uh, known through that uh, things that are not measured are not done, but you may end up measuring things that are never going to be done, or building measurement systems. So that's what I decided to make my emphasis in in execution and how do we change things. I think putting a road safety uh, in the in the in all our road projects that's part of in our governance system today. It's the part of the action plan of road safety of the IDB. The challenge is to keep the ministries uh, doing the investments and the institutional changes in road safety as they change hands on each political cycle. Uh, that's, that's the challenge. And I think the joint work needs to tackle that part of, the, of working together, not having joint operations or joint meetings. That we already do. We, we need to put uh, our projects jointly to work uh, in, in the benefit of uh, showcasing all that this huge amount of brains here are able to, to, to put in the planning stage. And, and I think that goes for the measurement and, and that goes also for, for, the, for the, um, the planning part. Would others like to chime in on this question about leverage? Mr. Luis? Uh, the, issue, the issue of leveraging <coughs> Is it working? Yeah. The issue of leveraging in our infrastructure strategy approved uh, earlier this year, not last year, sorry, we are focusing on that. So no matter how much money we can mobilize, it's really very little compared to the needs, the one trillion million. So the second pillar, the, the third pillar of our strategy is precisely leveraging. And what does it mean? Being able to work with others to attract other sources of funding. Private sector, of course. Climate finance, of course. In reality, we see that no matter how much succeed, and we are starting to measure our ability to leverage. But independently of this, if you look at, say, what is that is at stake here? It is governments that have to mobilize sources of funding to complement this if we want to tackle this agenda. Think about the following. If you talk about urban transport. We are moving away from poor systems that were self-sustaining, but very poor, could could not deliver the services to better services that are more sustainable, cost more, and may require some subsidies. If these subsidies are not seen in the context of a national policy at the same level of standing that other ways of seeing public goods that require some sort of subsidization, there's no way you can do it. If a national government doesn't have a policy in which, say, they decided will support cities so they can grow in a different manner, 
avoiding the fragmentation that you can see if uh, this is uh, done in, in, a, in a chaotic or not, not, not well-planned function, you have a problem. So here is where it comes. It's, a, it's going to be about policies and national and local coordination. And this is where the bank can make a difference working together. If, for example, the, the coordination is not, not necessarily the indicators, but rather approaches to sustainable development and sustainable policies. So if a, a client, we, we work with clients that are the most innovative and at the forefront of this policy agenda and those that are more reluctant. And the challenge is to get the most from those that we can test and demonstrate to the others, but work with the others and walk them, which will take a while. We call this an engagement. You cannot achieve all these results in one project, but you know that you are moving in that direction. It's in this context that this joint effort makes a big difference, knowing that no matter where that client goes to which multilateral, we get the same kind of advice in terms of the policies. That you don't make it easy just to mobilize the funding through one and ignore particular issues. We have already moved on road safety. So we decided on road safety, we have a, a joint initiative and we are doing this with common indicators and allowing us, every one of us, to work on road safety with client countries in any, any place. Please. Robert, and, and if, you, if you wanted to, I, I wanted to pick up what uh, Jose Luis raised, I think one, one of the points he raised was this issue of climate finance and whether or not we should be thinking about blending this money with climate finance money. And just if you also wanted, as part of your interventions, to re remark on that. What, what are some of the advantages of that? Are there some risks? How should we be thinking about that issue? I'm not ready to talk about that. Just <laughs> well, I, well, please we, go with we'll, your intervention we'll, and we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, I just, we'll, I'd like to follow this theme that, that Jose Luis introduced, which is, um, you know, we, we like to claim credit when things go right, and we like to claim credit when, when uh, we have things like the Sustainable Transport Initiative and we start shifting our portfolio. But, um, in fact, we can only do that when it is what our clients demand from us. Now, with your permission, I want to take another poll. How many people in the room here do not work for a multilateral development bank? Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, see, this is fantastic because developing that demand for sustainable transport, we can only do so much in terms of policy dialogue. We go on our programming missions. We do our project designs. But where does the demand come from? It comes from the dialogue that you folks have with your stakeholders. And what I would like to hear when Manesh lets you get up to the microphone is how you're going to help us do that. <laughs> and, and, and maybe, uh, you know, implicit in that is that the demand yet isn't there at the level that we want. Clearly, the world has, all of us have a role to play in that. But the MDBs also are able to help create, generate some of that demand. And so maybe I'll, I'll put two questions out on the table. One is, if anyone wants to uh, grapple with the climate finance question. The other is, uh, what, what can MDBs do to help create, generate some of that demand? And the commentators also maybe to jump in with some thoughts on this as well, please. I think this is a very important point. And because there is a, sometimes the general belief that the multilateral development banks go into the offices of the government and say, you do this and you do that, and we will lend the money for this, and we will not lend the money for that. And this is probably happened in the past when I was very small, so I don't know about it. But, uh, <laughs> but in the present days, that doesn't happen. In the very best, uh, you can say no and give explanations why you say no, and you can force some projects to go in some direction, but is the countries who own the banks. This is an important issue. I mean, the banks are not owned by somebody in another planet. The countries that are receiving our funds are the owners of our own banks. Maybe the money is coming from different countries. But this, this is a key issue because otherwise, you know, we believe that we are so strong that we can do anything we want. And if things doesn't work out as we want, it's because we were wrong. And this is not the case. I mean, we really have to help educate, create capacity in the clients for them to demand the right things. And I think this is, has to be stressed. Otherwise, no commitment by the banks or the whole community can help in changing this. Uh, in order to do this, I think one has to really help the countries to learn. And the enforcement of the regulations to create the right institutions to be informed, and the main reason, and 
our contribution to this uh, uh, issue in, the, in Latin America has been the creation of this observatory. The observatory is not just to, get, to play, it's because when you go into any of these national governments or cities in Latin America, <clears throat> most of them have no information on where they base their decisions. They didn't have it. That is the first time in ages that there is information about 25 cities in, in the region. And even the mayors of the cities get surprised when they see the numbers that we have. So eventually now they will not be able to say, well, I had to make this decision because I was inspired in what you know, my uh, pillowcase told me last night. That is information now. And this information is not only for the governments. It's also for the civil society, for the universities, for you people to also learn and be able to challenge the government and force the governments of your own places or other places to make the right decisions and to demand the right funds for the MDDs to, to finance. So, so I got a, quite a few hands. I want to I stick with the client question for a moment. I got a couple of people that want to pick up the finance, but this question about you know just uh, the role of the MDBs in creating this demand, and I think that there's a good contested question. Um, yeah, I would like to say something. Please, on that. Corny. Yeah, I think that up to now we talk about it at the level that the MDBs would go to the countries and and create the demand. I think that Holger mentioned the term the new normal, and I think that this is something like. Opinions change in bilateral context, but it's also like the multilateral uh, level. And I think that what, what José Luis mentioned about transport having a table, a seat at the table of the G20, I think that that's very important. And I think that that is something where we should uh, exploit the 175 billion because in a way it buys us a seat at the, at the policy uh, table at, at the global level. And I think by having sustainable transport integrated in the sustainable development discussion, in the sustainable development goals, and we have not achieved that so far, and I think that more needs to be done on that, and this is where I think that, that the <coughs> banks should also focus more of their attention. And I think like if you talk about the 95-5% rule, 95% of the resources go into the, into the national efforts in their projects, but firewall some resources to work at the global level in these in these policy dialogues, because I think that that will be very supportive. Others on this theme, uh, Michael Holder. Yeah, yeah just I, I, think I want to echo a few of these comments on the importance of data and shining a spotlight on where we are today and where we're headed and where we could be. Alternatively, I think it takes a very modest investment of what we spend on transportation to get good data observatories, for example. And that should be a high priority for any investment by multilateral banks, by national governments, by city governments, is just to get a better picture of where we are, where we're going, and some alternative visions about where we could go if we apply a, an avoid, shift, improve paradigm. And that paradigm has now become the new uh, emerging normal uh, way of thinking because the old paradigm has failed us. And I think there's a growing recognition of that. And I think echoing Corny's point, we've talked for many years in the sustainable transport community about low carbon strategies and greenhouse gases. And I think what we're seeing now is a merger of the sustainable development equity and economic development movement that has a much stronger global base than the movement to directly address greenhouse gases, which is a critical concern. But we have to bring those together. We have to bring together sustainable low carbon transport. And I think promote within the climate discussion policy framework the ways in which the transport sector can contribute to global sustainable equitable development serving poor people, serving low-income countries, while also producing huge benefits for climate that we can get at extremely low cost. In fact, often at net positive benefits, uh, it doesn't cost us anything. So finding better ways of framing those economic arguments, those equity arguments, and having those picked up and articulated more effectively by legitimate voices from the global south I think is a path forward in the global challenge of governance and strategy development. Having those 
sustainable low carbon transport strategies embedded in country strategies that are developed and negotiated by ministries of finance with the strategy departments at the MDBs which create the pipeline for projects which then go to the program officers to prepare for consideration by the bank boards. We need to get upstream in that pipeline project of where the initial concepts are developed. And this means we have to get across sectoral strategies. It also means that we need to be communicating with ministries of finance, not just transport ministers and environment ministers. Fantastic. Uh, let, let me turn to Jose Luis and then Holger, and then I'm going to come to you for the climate finance. I cannot agree more with Michael. And what we are doing now in the bank in terms of linking climate change finance policies with the infrastructure, the way we see infrastructure. Imagine the following. If we miss this opportunity, when we have an agenda, we have one trillion in needs, in future needs. And at the same time, we realize that unless we retrofit existing infrastructure, we are going to have, I think, our report, the recent report on turning down the heat is saying 1.3 degrees up as a result just of not retrofitting our infrastructure. So climate change, people have to see that the action has moved from the advocacy time that they were doing to the infrastructure sectors where the correction have to take place. So that's one point. How we do that? The first thing I was mentioning in the previous session. See, we realize that we have perhaps done a poor job in trying to visualize, conceptualize in a creative manner what are the benefits of this agenda. So the bank has committed to start measuring greenhouse emissions of our portfolio. But at the same time, we are going to value the benefits of the reductions that we are achieving and incorporating this into project economic analysis. We are also doing the same thing with the social cost being life saves, health outcomes. To have a tool that shows the two sides. So far, we have been neglected by the climate change agenda just because we, in the developing world, we may not have today the big emissions that are, maybe these funds are looking for, but they may come in the future if we don't make the right decisions today. And also, because we have a, a very interesting local benefit agenda that we say, well, why then climate change? On the opposite. This is the win-win kind of situation where you can blend the two sides and make things happen and, and have a catalytic effect on in moving ahead with this agenda. So this is what we are trying to do now uh, from the World Bank perspective. And just, just on that last point, that, that transportation emissions as a share of global greenhouse gas emissions are expected to go up 50% in the next 20 years, to underscore that point. Do you, do you want to come now into this question about whether we should blend Sustainable transport funding with climate finance. Yes, I think, yes, I think we, we, we need to blend those, or we need to continue blending that funding. But picking up on what Jose Luis was saying, uh, we have many sources that are in some way helping to change the rules of the game in terms of what technologies we are using for new equipment, what uh, are the best uh, structure, tariff structure to actually make the shift of uh, modes to to take place or work on demand travel uh, management uh, systems or transport oriented systems that will help to avoid the, the and that's, that's that's going to be sourced and uh, by funds that we have out there like the GEF, like the uh, green fund like uh, the 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 the, the NAMAS type of a uh, new world structures but we have to keep in mind that the old world needs to be changed and it's a big amount of funding that is required, not only to retrofit the existing systems, like Jose Luis was saying, which is a huge investment, and, and, and that needs to be done with in, in, a, in, a, in a innovative way, help with this. I think that's where the, the climate change funding can really help to structure those type of new projects, new policies, but the scaling up of that has to come from increasing the amount in the base. And that's, I think Robert was saying, that that's where we need all of you to help increase the importance of the transport sector, but increase it not only in the discussions and in the global forums, but also in the national budgets. And when we are talking in the Latin America, for example, that we're still investing 1.5% in transport, the old transport, very small percent of the new sustainable transport that needs, needs to be changed, but that amount is going to be insufficient. 
and we need to take it up to 3%, 4%, 5%, and that is not going to happen with, with uh, innovative ways of <laughs> building a cash flow or creating a financial structure that will add value, that will add value to, to whatever I'm doing, but it's not, to, it's not going to change the game if we don't increase investment. And that, that, that to me, is taking the agenda, uh, the transport in the agenda at a higher point. I think that's the basic. If we do that, we are going to be able to be more effective in that. All those innovative things that are being funded either to structures, analysis, or actual uh, showcasing projects of the new world are, are, are going to be really scaling up. And that's, that's, that's my take on the financing part. Okay, last, last comment on Holger, and then I'm going to open this up to the audience to start thinking about some, uh, some questions you want to ask the panelists. Particularly on the issue of, of climate change, and Jose Luis were referring us to the excellent reporters who recently come out from the World Bank. We simply also can't afford to, to, to wait. We can't afford also to progress slowly. So we need really this more radical paradigm shift if we really want to tackle also climate change. So here also this, this initiative is important, but it's also really, really urgent. So as we all know, so the way we build now our infrastructure in our city will heavily also influence also the, the carbon footprint, but also of course also the, the accessibility also of in its inhabitants. One specific point on, on the blending. I think we have now with the banks also coming together, coming with that commitment, and also with the Sustainable Low Carbon Transport Partnership, some stronger voices in us. We're currently designing us as a Green Climate Fund. So now is also the time also to stronger raise the issue also of sustainable transport here by designing that. Can we also have in that also a transport window? Can we have also here specific money which also then also allows banks better to negotiate also with national governments, also to, to, to have interest rates which are still interest them to include also issues like adaptation? So, so I think it's a good time to also raise a voice for sustainable transport here in these negotiations and in this design, because we we working towards also a hundred billion US dollar commitment com commitment annually, and so so this can also wonderfully add also what the bank's doing here, and I think that helps also then providing further incentives also to national governments to 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 take action. Thank you, Holger. Let's, uh, let's turn to the audience. Please uh, come up. We have a couple of mics in the middle. Uh, please go up there. Just brief introduction of who you are and, uh, and your question. And we're going to take them, given the number of people, we're going to take about three or four uh, directed to a panelist or to the group, and, and then we'll take some quick responses. So let's see if we can do a couple of, a couple of rounds. Yeah. Lucha. Uh, I, I will talk in, in, in behalf of the demand side because we are working with the stakeholder that is working day to day on the field. We have associated the, the more advanced system in Latin America in the uh, Latin American Association of, uh, that is called CBRT. And our main issue when we discuss is how to get the best quality in the transit service because our, the, the goal of the association and the, and, the, and the agency and the system is how to get the user satisfaction with the services. That is the main point. And we think about this, we are talking about some numbers, and we have figured out what will be the capital investment to move from here to 10 years ahead, 10 years ahead, you know, to close the gap of the ring system that we have in Latin America to a really better, affordable, reliable, you know, good service in transit. And it is 100, 100 billion dollars in 10 years. 30% of this investment, capital investment, would be BRT, in, 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 in BRT infrastructure. And the other 70% would be renewal of the fleet that will be, obviously, uh, uh, contributed by the private sector. The question is, if we put in the first third you know, solution like 
a ray technology that is at the best quality solution, and we recognize it is the, the, the investment will be increased 10 times in the at least one third of the, of the first 30 percent. Go to a 100 uh, 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 billion dollars, you know, uh, for the, the, this. And we are trying to, uh, you know, just, just uh, quickly, that, just, I, just I will close, I will close my intervention, Manish, with this, with this idea. Just stop, stop. I will stop. I will stop. Very, very, I will stop. I will stop with this idea. We are, we are trying, I will stop. I will stop with, with 30, 30 seconds, please, Manish, because it's a very important idea. We are trying to create an alliance of the mass in transit together with Alamis, CBRT together with Alamis, you know, to set, to, to work how the best quality of the metro and the best quality of the BRT go to be expanded in the whole city, door-to-door -door solution. How the banks could do, uh, we know that the restriction to work with the government, but what we can do, if you can to put some condition in the loans, saying we can support a rail project, but you have the obligation, the duty, to implement an integrated transport system. That is my point. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finishing one minute. Uh, first question, second proposal. First question is, uh, first, my name is Hiroaki Suzuki from Abanka of the World Bank. First question, this number 175 billion, from where you got this number? Second, uh, I agree that uh, we have to leverage the financing and we have to do everything like uh, all international uh, financial institution plus green fund, I fully agree. But still, this is money coming from outside, outside to city, outside to developing country. Right. And I, in this context, I fully agree with Jose that money together with Political commitment should come from the government, but in real time from the urban sector. <coughs> Transport is not only the demand, water is there, waste water, and also uh, housing is a huge demand. So it's a political system, so it's not easy. So what I propose is why not we cannot capture the value of uh, increased value of land which will be created directly by public transport in, transportation. And since it's invested by government, government is entitled to collect this money and to reinvest for public transport. And the proposal is our unit, with the support of PF, we are going to launch a study on value capture. Uh, so we'd like to invite all institutions to join with us. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Let's take a few more. Uh, <clears throat> Mark Weiss from Global Urban Development. And I, I first want to take a moment to really congratulate and thank the eight development banks, the UN, uh, uh, and all of the organizations that are part of the SLOCA, especially uh, Embark and ITDP, for this amazing accomplishment, this, this really important commitment that I think we all hope will be a game changer. And I wanted to ask, uh, in order to and able to become a game, a game changer, assuming on this issue of leverage, assuming that most of the money is going to go uh, to help finance uh, transportation, infrastructure, construction type projects. Uh, first, on the uh, financial leverage that got discussed, uh, it, is, is it possible that the development banks could actually require some percentage of the total cost of the projects come from other public and private sources, or, or at the very least give a higher priority for uh, projects that have a lot of uh, 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 leverage in addition to the bank financing. Uh, so that's on the financial. On the second, on the strategic policy and planning leverage, and Corny actually talked about it at the global policy level, but I'm just wondering if it would be possible uh, for the development banks to essentially require the states and provinces, the regional authorities, the local governments, to have an overall sustainable mobility strategy and to demonstrate how this specific project really forwards the 
success of that overall strategy. And finally, on the economic development leverage, would it be possible to at least encourage uh, tying the specific projects to a broader ec economic uh, growth plan to, and to dem so that the, uh, uh, to demonstrate how this investment is really going to help grow businesses, jobs, and incomes more generally? Thank you. Uh, my name is Gerhard Menkov. I'm affiliated with ITDP and the World Bank. I'm a bit troubled. We are all talking about sustainable transport as if we all agreed what it was. Um, just some exam examples of specific projects. And I'm a project person, so th these things come up. How about a ring road around a city? How many times did I hear that the ring road around a city, which many of us would think is not a sustainable investment, really is good for environment because it keeps the through traffic out of the city. If it's well designed, it's good for traffic uh, in terms of traffic safety because a good motorway is safer than city streets. Okay, ring roads, sustainable transport. Another thing, um, flyovers in the cities. Oh, you know, India is great in this, but uh, there are many, many other countries have a flyover over congested intersections, and we had many discussions with, you know, with serious people who said, no, but you build the flyover, you reduce congest congestion, and therefore you have a benefit in terms of uh, emissions, which in the, in the short term is probably correct. Okay, it's flyover a uh, sustainable transport. Metros. Metros can be great things, uh, really, if, if they are the right metros in the right place. But many of us know that they are often not the right solution at the right place. They're always expensive, and which is of course great. That way you can really churn up a lot of money to come up to $195 million. No? So I'm just asking all eight of you, how do you see it? Uh, may, 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 maybe one thing which, I, uh, which occurred to me is uh, you know, m many of us have worked with the GEF, Global Environmental Facility. And Global uh, GEF got involved in urban transport over 10, 12 years ago. And at that time they actually came up with guidelines. And they said what does and doesn't count for something that can be supported by the GF. Now, we're talking much bigger money now than GF. Are the MDBs coming up with some joint guidelines? What is a sustainable project? Thank you. We're going to take two or three more, please. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Haywood from MIT. My question is for the group based on something that Michael said about needing to integrate the idea of equity um, development equality into transportation projects. Um, my question is how, what is the most effective way to do this? Who should do this? How can this be done? And how can the MDBs really contribute? A lot of the rhetoric today has been surrounding climate change, energy, things like that. That's been what's done in the past. How can these arguments from um, a societal level be integrated into the MDB projects and into other projects that are being done around the world? Thank you. Uh, hi, um, my name's uh, Josh Rathod. I'm with Advanced Biofuels USA. And I heard somebody said that energy and transportation are ultimately linked. Um, that's true because, you know, in order to get from place to place, you gotta put something in the tank, or it depends upon if it's solar, electric, whatever. And then someone also said that in order to tap into the trillion dollars out there, we need to educate. Um, so what we do, we've, we've spent a lot of time on the Hill trying to educate senators, house reps, um, things like that. And what I'm interested in is how much of this effort is actually going to be focused on the energy um, side of things because it does also affect you know, production, uh, production of transport, um, the factories and whatnot. So yeah, that's my question. How, how much of this push is going to be focused on energy and specifically the fuel side of transportation. Thank you. Could take, uh, go ahead, please. I think we're. Uh, Bryce McNitt, USDOT. Uh, I was wondering if the uh, development banks would be willing to lower interest rates to encourage sustainable transport projects, make them more feasible. <laughs> Lori, so, so we're going to, very quickly, let's take two more and then we're going to give one round 
to respond, please. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. In getting together the funding for these efforts, to what extent will you be able to use the internet to bring the parties together and get transparency and have people see what their share in the project is getting them? Hi, Ken Meyer, Cord, World Docs. Uh, our foremost uh, forecaster of uh, uh, world oil s supply is uh, the Energy Information Administration predicted just 10 years ago that uh, global oil production in 2020 would be 120 million barrels a day. Now they're talking about around 90 million barrels a day. Uh, even this in 2020, uh, even this may be wishful thinking. Uh, it seems like talking about the possibility that world oil supply is declining would be an effective way to promote uh, the sustainable transportation initiative, especially as our leadership is so hesitant to consider the possibility of oil peaking. Um, uh, we don't have a choice. Uh, Petroleum-based transportation is inherently unsustainable. Uh, it's not that sustainable transportation is a nice idea and it'll help the client. Uh, if we are in a world of declining oil supplies, uh, it's either sustainable transport or no transport. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I realize we're about to head into overtime. So, so instead of answering each of you every single question, what I would encourage you to do is pick one or two that particularly resonated, answer those questions very succinctly, and then also um, I want to ask each of you just for a concluding kind of insight, a, a sentence or two, an aha moment you had during this session or a, a final message you want to leave the group. Uh, so just, just a sentence or two of kind of that final, final powerful thought you want to share with everyone. Holger, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you to go first and we're going to work our way backwards. Thank you, uh, <laughs> so if that's okay, Holger, please. Thanks, 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 Manish. Um, like to 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 pick on on one particular. So from uh, Gerd Gerd Menkov when he mentioned the the guidance, and I think that's a really really important um, idea. So because because I one opportunity is here, so to to have a better common agreement or so what sustainable transport means, and also what are probably the key principles or so that all the banks can can commit to, to also send a coherent message on the big picture. I think this is also uh, important for the communication. But then also coming to uh, the, the question of from, from MIT also on the different impacts. I think here ADB with the star rating started also to, to recognize and, and, and other banks are also going in, in the direction in terms of, of project assessment and making here so looking also into the different alternative and uh, that also relates again back to, to Gerhard to also look for what are the alternatives in terms of, of, of Metro BIT and what is the most sustainable way or so to, to in, invest the money. I know so we, we have to be aware so still so the request comes from the national government so it has to be a dialogue and in that respect so it's important and that's as a last thought um, how we bring these aid banks to the for the private banks and the national banks and should be there not a dialogue now and probably also to a wider commitment with, with BNDS, with KFW, with many others to also then agree on these principles and push the agenda so that we have also a wider common, common agreement. This is still some, probably it will take some time but that might be a way to go to really find also and leverage this money. Thank you, Michael. I'll, I'll take on the question that was posed about equity and how do we move towards greater equity in transportation investment. I think it's a complicated subject, but ultimately we need to start by being grounded and aware of where we are, what the patterns of existing transportation users are, and often our transport systems across the world are designed for men, for working men and we neglect to design transportation systems for women, for children, for the disabled, for elderly. So if we think about uh, design 
for universal, safe, and affordable access, then that will help to move us towards equity. It means making sure our public transport vehicles are safe and that women don't get raped and groped in them, which means addressing cultural issues around how people use the mobility system. It also means paying attention to the details on how people get to and from the major transport systems by things like street lighting and whether there are sidewalks, whether there are safe ways of crossing streets. The vast majority of all trips in the world today are pedestrian trips, over 25 billion a day. And we have, we're approaching 2 billion cars over the next decade. It won't, or the, over the next couple of decades. And the number of pedestrian trips will continue to eclipse the number of motor vehicle trips for the next generations. And so we need to focus on design for pedestrians, design for cyclists, design for priority for public transport, and efficient goods movement within our cities, and looking at the externality impacts of transport on people's health and environment and quality of life. If we do these things, we'll create healthy, livable, safe, and equitable uh, urban development. And in closing, I think we've had a lot of good questions raised in this session. I think we've had some very good ideas and good responses from the banks that, that give us some fertile ground on which to build. Uh, and I think that the way forward, to me, looks like it has some promise. Thank you. I also... Oh. <laughs> I heard somebody <laughs> applauded you, Mike. <laughs> Very quickly, also with respect to the question on equity, I think we also need to think in terms of strategy there, like it's important that the different advocacies on sustainable transport, I think that they start to talk more to each other so that we have the road safety uh, advocacy, we have the people fighting the fuel subsidies, we have the people looking at the climate change and I think that there is a tendency that these are starting to come more together and I think that the avoid, shift, improve paradigm, which was mentioned by a number of people, is very helpful in that context because we have discovered, like, even though that, is, that the avoid, shift, improve paradigm came up mainly from the environmental background, it is actually very suitable also for these other advocacies as well. I think in terms of, of final thoughts, uh, the motto of the, the slow cut work program for the next two years is from breakthrough to breakout. Huh? Like over the last few years, we have established a breakthrough in terms of sustainable transport that we have an agreement on this. Now the next thing is how do we take that to the rest of the world? Following the success that we had in Rio with sustainable transport, we have decided in the Slow Cut Partnership that we are now going to target the climate change uh, negotiations with renewed energy and vigor. And we have decided together with the Bridging the Gap initiative to have a full-fledged transport day in the COP on the 17th of November. So this will be for the next three years on the Sunday in between the two weeks of COP that we will have a full day on sustainable, on sustainable transport. So I hope that next year that we are sitting here and that we say that we will think about the successes that we will have achieved in Warsaw and how to take those forward. Thank you. So I will respond to some of the questions regarding the financing and, and then come up with some closing thoughts. Where are these uh, 175 billion coming from? Uh, as, as I mentioned before, the World Bank annually, so annual commitments, new commitments are between 4.5 billion, 5.5 billion. We're going to maintain it that way. But as mentioned before and confirmed by many, many of, uh, of you, Internal generation, say the capacity of the country and the cities to generate, say the sources of funding that you need to put in place this uh, uh, approach to sustainable transport will be of the essence. So that's why we need to work on the complementary policies that will make uh, this happen. Definitely, as mentioned before, value capturing, for example, uh, parking policies, free policies, full price policies, removing the subsidies, etc. This would be part of, of the menu that countries have to embark on. By, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of uh, the strategic plans that have to be associated with this, very interesting what I'm seeing in the bank. 
In the past, we were doing urban transport projects that were financing little pieces. Today, and for example, our engagement in Mexico is a good example, we require first give us some sort of strategic plan, what you want to achieve to make more sustainable transport, how you plan to coordinate with land, what are the policies you want to see coordinated and around this approach. This is, this is happening, and uh, this is transformational in terms of the impact it will, come, it will have. In closing, maybe uh, two takes away uh, from what I hear. I think we are on the right track on the global agenda, and, and it's the right direction. And we have now some partnerships that can, can get us some, some traction. Maybe we have to emphasize and put more attention to society, moving support for this transition. Sustainable transport requires challenging solutions, and we need the validation of, of, of the people. Make it, say, make it easier for mayors to implement these, these policies. Internalizing, for example, issues like road safety and, and uh, new ways of seeing sustainable transport will require changing behaviors. So that's another area we have to embark on. And, and also in, in seeing uh, what are the implications for those who are not, part, are not connected to all this. We still have an unfinished agenda. We still have 1.2 billion people that don't have access to our all weather road. So how can we embark on very complex issues when still you have that agenda? and you have people that don't even participate in this conversation. So we need to put the greater emphasis on the poor, or whatever we do at every level. That will imply probably improving the efficiency of whatever we do. Hmm? Integration of our urban transport systems. Uh, Gerhard mentioned a, a, few, a few challenges here. I would say integrating the services will be one, a key one, and if Lucho can deliver that Alamis and the BRT Association work together instead of killing each other. Great. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have a discussion of which alternative is best. So, and, and, and the other point I want to make in closing is uh, the scaling up. I, I take it that we have to do a much bigger job um, in terms of capacity building in reaching, say, government officials to better understand what sustainable transport is, and here again we have to partner, and sustain financing of sustainable transport. Big, big agenda. I commit the bank, we're going to be working a lot on these two aspects uh, this coming year. Thank you, Jose Luis. Robert? Yeah. Two quick points. Um, there was an interesting question about whether or not the MDB should require sustainable transport strategies before investing in projects. Um, well, of course, we don't invest in the absence of a strategy, but w what's interesting about the question is, what would define an acceptable sustainable transport strategy? And somebody else asked about, you know, the definition. Well, the definition I read out, ADB's definition of sustainable transport, has five things in it. So can you have something that is safe and affordable but increases emissions, and does that still count? Um, Maybe, right? And so coming to convergence on the definitions and requiring those as part of strategies is I think this policy dialogue that we have to have with, with our client governments, um, we're uh, working toward that now. I would say we're a few years away from consensus with our clients about what would constitute a sustainable transport strategy, but something worth doing. Um, my closing thought, I, th I think it's really interesting that in an event like this, we ask questions like, should we be considering climate change financing and what's the role of energy? Because um, that's a dumb question, frankly. They're all connected. And um, again, we've begun that conversation, making progress on it, a ways to go yet. And uh, I think this kind of uh, discussion is good for that. Um. To make it short, I not only endorse what my predecessors say, uh, I will insist in two or three points. Uh, the building of capacity is uh, our main contribution. The money is there, the money is available, but again, we think that the, the money has to, to be used properly, and the users are those who have to make the right choices, and in order to, for the users, the clients, governments, uh, do the right choice, I think they need your help. Uh, and I think that uh, our contribution is really to produce the instruments, to give the information, to generate uh, the 
places and the meetings in where this uh, arrangement can take place. Uh, and, uh, and we are making as much as we can, and, and this is the contribution that I think the development banks can, can do on, in addition to, to give money. Uh, the issue of the uh, social uh, inclusion is becoming uh, key. Uh, every government, whether they believe it or not in this, are requiring this as one of the main uh, aspects in every project that we are financing. Uh, and this aspect is conditioning the definition of what sustainable transport is. Uh, the considerations of uh, energy and environment that have been made in some of the questions, uh, with the information that we have already collected, we are in a position to do that. We are working in analyzing the industrial aspects of uh, vehicles manufacturing in the region, and this is very close related to the energy consumption. And uh, without the information that we collected in advance in the last five years, we wouldn't have been able to do this exercise. We are doing this with the industry, we are doing this with the energy producers, and we are trying to show the government how the lack of uh, control on the type of vehicles that they are promoting or that are letting be uh, go into the market can have a very strong impact. And this may be a small detail, but can have a strong impact on environment and the level of energy consumption. So uh, we have to continue providing funds to our clients, to the countries. Uh, we have to help them generating the strategies. And uh, we sometimes lend without having a strategy in front of that. We invite what uh, the Asian Development Bank do. Uh, many times the urgencies, uh, generally based on social needs, are uh, you know taking over the the times and uh, and the strategies are not there, but we are promoting the promo the produ production of national transport strategies and urban uh, uh, transport strategies as well. Uh, but uh, I think the most important part is to generate the dialogue within the countries between the different levels of authority, national and subnational governments, which is not very fluent. And, uh, and also uh, within the same level of government, uh, you will be surprised how difficult it is to get two ministers sitting in the same cabinet to talk to each other about common issues. And uh, this is the contribution that we can make, not as a conditionality for the lending, but as a contribution of being a neutral party to generate this interest uh, within the countries in the region. Not much to add, and I'm just going to give the long answer to Lucho's short question. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, but basically, you know, I, I, the, the question, several questions, including Lucho's, were related to internal things in the banks, and, and that really, really worries me a lot because uh, putting new conditions in the loans, uh, creating guidelines, uh, in even reducing. The, the interest rate are feasible, and we are actually very good at that. I mean, we're very good at creating guidelines, internal uh, procedures, and all that. In, in that, that. Several people have said here that this is a demand-driven issue, and, and we are not going to change the pattern or the behavior of that demand by making internal changes in the, in the, in the, in the institutions. I think our owners, which, which are the countries, have already made those changes, and we have the governance aspects that require, and that's why we heard here several changes that have taken place in the portfolios and, and all that. <laughs> we do have it in the IDB through our general capital increase. We have a specific mandates, quantitative mandates to go and do more sustainable lending, uh, which includes transport and the, other, and the other sectors, to work in collaboration with other um, areas, energy, and uh, and the climate change community at the same time, and, and I think that's that's a, that's that's in place. We we have to find ways to get to the demand side, to get to the users who are going to be, to be really the drivers of, of 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 change, who are the ones keeping many of the BRTs operating today, even past several cycles uh, uh, that could have. Uh, taken back all that has been advanced, and I think that's that's the place where we jointly have to to to, to work uh, together in two ways. I think, like I said at the beginning, with the new things, the innovative part that's usually done in small groups, small communities, high knowledge communities like this one. But the the challenge is how do we cross the chasm of going to the mass uh, uh, population to the 
country level decisions, and that's the challenge and we have to really join forces to, to work on the different levels of decision makers and the societal level, like, like Jose Luis was saying, and I will close by that. Um, thank you very much. Great, thank you. And maybe just, just one very last point. I, I, I felt that, uh, for, first, thank you all for the tremendous contributions you've made. I, I felt we did a very nice job of talking about some of the, some of the analytical kind of co constraints, kind of how you make the case for sustainable transport. That came out quite a bit. We talked a lot about, about the financing requirements, recognizing that this commitment at the end of the day is, is quite small relative to the existing investments or the needs. How do we be catalytic? We talked about many of the capacity challenges that we face. Um, but and we talked a little bit about, but I also think quite important, the political dimensions of these questions, the political economy dimensions, particularly at the local level. And one of the questions is how can this money best create the constituencies at the local level that create the demand for sustainable transport? What more can be done? And I just want to kind of leave you with that thought, but ask all of you to uh, extend a really warm round of applause uh, to our great panelists. Uh, And, 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 and as a mark of real success, I've never seen a room 20 minutes late with lunch waiting, and we still have a full room. So a testament to how much people wanted to listen to you. Thank you all. And before you leave for lunch, I know I'm standing between you and, and food. I have two quick housekeeping announcements. We're trying to streamline the entrance process so that all of us, or the majority of us, are in the auditorium tomorrow when Dr. Kim and Mayor Bloomberg are speaking. In order to do that, you must bring your badge with you tomorrow. And with that, you can enter either the 8th Street entrance or the 18th Street entrance starting at 7.30. So please come early. Please travel light. Leave your luggage at home if you don't need it. It'll facilitate getting through the screening. And um, starting 7.30, you can use either entrance. So we're going to take a break for lunch. Afterwards, we have three parallel sessions. The China session will be here. The session on public bicycles is in a room downstairs. If you take the northwest elevators right outside Preston and you go down one level, you'll see signage. The third parallel session is on governance. And as I mentioned, there's an error in the program. The room is actually MC2800. So you're, you want to look for the southwest elevators, which are behind Preston that way, and go up one level, and you'll find signs. So enjoy lunch. We'll start parallel sessions at 2 o'clock.